like you said, my name is Oz Rashid. Um, and what I mean by the people analytics revolution is that numbers and statistics have been part of business since business was conceived. Um, what's really been focused on in, in terms of the functions is financial analysis, sales analysis, right? And marketing, right? It has been really prolific from a big data perspective. And the reason for that is that Wall Street for public companies, a lot of times is asking about those types of numbers. Right. And so what's really started to change is that there's starting to be an understanding of how engagement, attrition, and tenure really impact how you value a business and, and where the business is going and how you forecast for the business. And so, and in fact, you're seeing the SEC is starting to regulate that chief human resource, resources officers and chief people officers come onto those calls to be able to talk through some of those statistics. Um, I read a study with Deloitte uh, around that uh, in 2018, companies from a maturity perspective, only 17% globally were leveraging people analytics. Mm. And of those, the vast majority were using it on an ad hoc basis, not in a systemized way. So as that number starts to increase, um, you're going to start to see more companies getting ahead by leveraging that people data to make great decisions. So you, I, I'm fascinated about big data and, and we've talked a lot about um, that on the show in a lot of realms. What's interesting is you said uh, engagement, attrition, and tenure seem to be three of the, the ways that you're measuring the workforce. Did I get those right? Yep, yep. I, I would also say that those are very traditional, right, statistics. I'm going to use a, an analogy. I'm going to use a sports analogy, right? Many people are familiar with Moneyball, right? Sure. And Moneyball, with the, that happened about 30 years ago. It's a true story, obviously the GM of the Oakland Athletics, Billy Bean, wanted to find efficiencies in how he could use his shoestring budget to compete with some of the bigger organizations. And they were looking at traditional statistics like RBIs, home runs, and batting average. Um, and when he brought in an analytics team, they started looking deeper and looking at statistics mm. that actually led to winning, like on-base percentage and slugging percentage and war. And so when you bring up attrition and tenure and engagement, to me, those are the RBIs, home runs, and batting oh, average of okay. the past. And there's new analytics that are going to give us more information on engagement, productivity, and, and quite frankly, be predictive around what to expect around your employee base. Well, give us an example. What, what are some of those things that are the new way of tracking the workforce? Yeah, I mean, you know, so a lot of times in hiring, they talk about time to fill. Um, I'm more interested in time to productivity, right? When you hire somebody, how long does it take them to ramp up and get to where they need to be, right? And if you can figure mm -hmm. out the behavioral characteristics that that entails, then you're going to be able to hire better people that can get up to speed faster and start providing value for your company. Um, there's something called employee lifetime value, right? That's a lot like customer lifetime value on the marketing side. Um, I've seen value over replacement employees. So when you look at the average employee, what is bringing in somebody exceptional do in terms of pro productivity and capacity? Mm. Um, all different types of things. A lot, a lot of them predictive around maybe people leaving your organization and attrition to your capacity, to the workload that they're able to handle. So Tons of stuff here, and it's only going to develop and mature more and um, find more unique insights. With your experience, um, how many companies, what percentage of companies are tracking this right now? I mean, we people analytics is a thing. We can Google it and learn that. Sure. But are we in the just the very, very beginning days of that? Yeah, I mean, what you would see is that a lot of the biggest companies in the world are, are leveraging it, right? I'll give an example. HP, um, they did a study around... Um, likely flight risk, right? And what they were looking at was they realized that uh, they went through a bunch of different data sets. And what they realized is that when they promoted somebody but didn't give them a raise, that person was 50% more likely to leave the company. Google's done similar things around um, when they hire somebody and they haven't been promoted in four years, that person is 50 to 70% more likely to leave the company. And so when you know these types of things, you can start to uh, not work against them necessarily, but apply them to the way that you manage and also be able to build better engagement with some of those employees to mitigate some of those losses. There's so much cost associated with losing great employees. And, and, and we heard of the great resignation a few years ago. That's something that really costs companies a lot in terms of opportunity costs and actually bottom line financial costs. And I think we're only at the beginning of starting to understand how impactful that is. And when we do, we'll see that CEOs and CFOs start paying more attention to some of those people analytics. So to answer your question, not many companies are doing mm. it that much right now, um, but we're starting to see in terms of the clients and customers that we work with, more are putting importance on it. And you're going to start to see that start to really um, hit, a, hit a critical point going forward where even the smallest companies are more democratizing their ability to leverage people analytics to make decisions for their company. As you said, uh, Moneyball was 30 years ago and, and it's only now that we're really starting to see the sensor verse, if you will, 
sure. um, be uh, generally applied in athletics all the way down to high school athletics and, you know, wearing, you know, watches and, and these kinds of things. So I, I, I'll be curious to see what happens in the workforce. In the companies that are doing a good job of this, that are showing best practices, because there's a lot of companies that are doing that, how much of this is training leadership and training managers and directors about this new way to be thinking about the workforce? Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. I mean, I talk a lot about being data influenced rather than data driven, right? I still think there's something to be said about experience and intuition, right? But it has to be data informed. And so I think it's really important that whatever the function your leaders are in, they understand the data sets they're getting. They understand what to do with the insights that are being driven from that. So I think that's a really big part of it. But I think the biggest thing that companies have to deal with is that there's so much data available, right? We're collecting data at all times. Like you said, the sensors are just one aspect of that. When you have this much data, right? The key becomes how do you manage this data? How do you extract the data? How do you make sure that it's comprehensive? You know, many, you've heard the cliche, men lie, women lie, numbers don't. That's not actually true. We've all seen people can cherry pick statistics to tell the story that they want to tell. And so what's really important is making sure that you're looking at the data in the right way. You're looking at the data comprehensively and that you have it readily available so you can make quick decisions. So as much as I think training the managers and leaders to be able to understand that information, I think enabling them through great technology, through great reporting is probably the most critical aspect for companies and probably why it's been so slow on the uptake because that's hard. It's very difficult. What do you say, I'm I'm curious about a conversation you have with a hiring manager who relies on their gut and their intuition. And they say, yep, I see what the numbers say, Oz. My gut's telling me we have to go with this person. They're going to be great. And, and, you, and you're looking at the numbers and you're like data informed, right? Yep. So where is that balance going to happen? Where, I mean, are the machines going to be doing the hiring for us? Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is the, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect, but what that is, is that people who are not experts in certain areas overestimate their ability to make good decisions in that space. So I think we see a lot of that, especially in hiring, yeah. right? And, and a lot of your hiring is actually um, coming from experience or people that you've interviewed in the past or something that you've read. And I do believe that that can be codified. But to me, the way that technology works with that human intuition and the best way to do that is through artificial intelligence and understanding hiring managers and different biases, right? Of course, there's, you know, diversity biases, unconscious and conscious, right? There's things like recency bias, right? What we saw most recently is, 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 is better than what we saw two weeks ago. And then there's confirmation bias. And I'll tell you a quick story. As somebody who's been involved with tens of thousands of hires throughout my career at this point, I suffer from this from time to time too. We had an interview a couple of weeks ago for a VP for our company and interviews going well. He had some things that he was missing in terms of experience and industry experience that we thought would, would be really relevant. But then we started talking about uh, his background and he told me that he played basketball. I love basketball. He told me that he was a point guard. I was a point guard. He told me, I asked him, who, who is your basketball game like? He said, Steve Nash. And I'm a Phoenix Suns fan. So already I was feeling, I was starting to feel a little more connection with him, right? And then he said something that really resonated with me. He said, why I like being a point guard is because I feel like getting an assist is more important than a point. I like setting people up. This is something that has been ingrained in me from a young age that has really guided sure. me in my professional career. And so subsequently, I realized after the fact, and I was reflecting, I was so excited about what he was saying that he was mirroring things that I thought were important that I probably wasn't as diligent on the rest of the questions mm. I should have been asking, right? Mm. So for me, I was getting my own sense of confirmation bias. And I think if technology, right, can read us, understand us and call these things out, you're more likely to, to in real time, make better decisions. And that's where I think human intuition and, and artificial intelligence and machine learning can combine to get better results and create a more human experience. I want to, I was just thinking the guy probably did his homework on you and uh, was smart. And so I kind of, I kind of like that about him. Um, let's go back to the cost. You had a, a term for it, but it was how quickly they can be producing uh, within an organization. So whether it's a salesperson or it's an engineer in lines of code or or whatever it is, there's this mean time before they're producing. And I know a lot of businesses measure what's my cost per employee, what's the revenue per employee, all of those kinds of things. And, and that's very, very expensive. Is What's your experience in... Um, 
organizations really understanding that cost? In terms of time to productivity? Yeah, like putting a, a number, I, I, in my experience, working with hiring managers over the years, I only met one company who, who knew exactly how much that costs per day. And so the challenge for her in hiring people was measured on a per day basis because she knew what it cost to not have that person in. But yeah. that was super rare. Yeah, it's difficult. It is somewhat subjective because it's not like revenue, right? Where you can directly attribute a number to how somebody's performing, right? At the end of the day, what you have to look at from a time to productivity perspective is what is the average that you have for your company and what are the behavioral characteristics that come with that? I think uh, the Department of Labor, they had a statistic that uh, a bad hire costs you 30% of somebody's annualized salary. And that's not even speaking to how long a role is open, retraining somebody and the costs that come associated with having somebody that leaves your organization, there's attrition. Mm -hmm. So different companies are looking at and measuring in different ways. I think the key is there's no silver bullet, right? We can put these wide sweeping statistics out there for some companies, but depending on your industry, depending on your function, depending on your learning and development within your organization, those can all be different factors that are going to lead to different costs. And quite frankly, if we want chief executive officers and chief financial officers to pay attention to these types of things, you have to have validity around your data sets. So I think what's really important yeah. is constantly measuring it, right, against different functions and different segments um, and, and, and continuing to be current on that. Because I think the biggest thing that can really hurt your credibility as you as you go into people analytics is, well, this is fuzzy science, or this is something that um, I can't mm. put hard science around. And so thus, I don't take it as seriously which is not the case. It's just a matter of making sure that you're getting the data from the right place, you're constantly updating it, um, and that you're making, making sure that you're making it unique and customized to your organization. A couple of, couple of questions come to mind. One, one is, uh, you used a word very interesting, but in a completely new context for me. You said flight risk. Mm -hmm. Explain that a little, because I'd not heard that. You had said that Someone who, for instance, had not had gotten a promotion, but had not gotten a commensurate raise with the promotion became a flight risk. I normally think of that in terms of criminals, not in terms of employees. Yeah, I mean, I'll go back to that HP study I was talking about. The reason that came up is because they saw that they had 20% attrition in their sales division. And that was way higher than it had been across other functions. And the reality of the situation is, sure, people leave for more money. People leave for different tangible reasons, right? But the big reason is if you don't have engagement from your people, if you don't, if you're not learning and developing and putting a plan around your people, those are going to be the type of things that can ultimately lead to flight risk. So I've seen all different types of things from people updating their LinkedIn um, and, and some real big brother type situations to kind of be predictive around people leaving. I don't necessarily know that I agree with that. But I also think that things like going back and looking at you know, when we promote somebody and don't give them a raise, are we really valuing them? Are we really mm. showing them? You know, it's almost, um, you know, it's almost a, a derelict to be able to give that promotion without giving the raise, right? And so when you have that information, you can go back and you can make better decisions at the end of the day. And so I think that's a big one because, you know, we talked about the great resignation. There's more agency for employees than ever before, right? And I think that's a great thing. The pendulum was too far to organizations for the longest time. And I think it started to go a little bit back to the center of, of giving the employees that agency. And with that, right, they're going to, you know, potentially leave your organization, which leaves a hole for you, right? Not only if it's, especially if it's unexpected, right? You have to go and you have to refill that. Um, and then who knows what the level of talent demand is or how much more you might have to pay. So I think looking at that flight risk and figuring out predictively who is most likely and then intervening, right, in a way that is, um, uh, are going to help you keep that person, or you do things that are more likely to keep that person engaged and staying at your company is really, really key. So with that, in that context in mind, is, is this a generational problem on top of what we've seen with COVID? Generationally, I mean, you know, my parents, they had a job for life, right? That was the job they had. And now, um, I'm seeing people cycle in 18 to 20 months, and then they're moving on because they just feel like they need to, it, it, it may not be more money. It's like, no, this is what I do. I'm going to go get more experience. I'm going to try this. And I'm wondering, is that generational or or not? 
I think to some aspect it's generational. I think the amount we make it generational is a little bit overblown. I think it's societal, okay. right? Oh. Um, if you look back to mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, when they worked, they were with a company for 30 years and, and there was probably a little bit more loyalty. Um, but there's also a lot less you know, potential options, right? You didn't have recruiting. You didn't have social media. You didn't have online to really see what else was going on around there. I mean, divorce rates are up from 20, 30 years ago. Really, people are, are and we can say this is a problem or this is a good thing. People are seeing what else is out there and they're making the decisions on what's important to them um, and moving forward. And I don't think that's a Gen Z thing. I don't think that's a millennial thing, right? The thing that I think is, is, is really across all generations and all different segments of the workforce is people want to be part of something bigger than themselves. I think that's the number mm. one thing. Your work has to have meaning, right? It doesn't matter if you're at the tail end of your career. It doesn't mean it matter if you're at the early part of your career. Your work has to have meaning. You have to be invested in, right? You have to be developed and have a, a, a career development plan and feel like the company is putting into you as much as you're putting into them, right? Um, those are just some aspects, right? Money is important. Benefits are important. Flexibility is important, right? A lot of times when we say flexibility, we think of work from home, but there's all different types of aspects of flexibility, right? Um, and because people are aware of what else is out there and they have more of that agency, it's even more critical that we understand what these you know, general motivating factors are and build our organizations, our cultures around them. Um, that's what we've tried to do at our company. That's what we recommend to our clients. And that's what we've seen to lower your attrition. If you can push up the levers in some of those spaces, um, you're going to have good results. Oz, you've given us a lot to think about. Thanks so much. You got it.